thank you very much uh, for the opportunity, everyone. Uh, one thing about this session, this session is not really about software. I mean, it's barely about software. It's far more about uh, finding the best approach of LIDAR or photogrammetry to use and to collect data, and then the software would be in a subsequent session. So um, I'll step into this a little bit. You, you all have seen the title. I'm not going to run through this, but it, it, it's all about uh, considering deliverables, uh, understanding the criteria. You could take this little sheet I've got right here and use it when you go to talk to a client about a job or you, you look at a job, fill out the information on this type of stuff. That's critical. As we run through this, we're going to look at reality capture and practice. And let me, a very brief background on myself. Uh, I've been surveying since uh, 1977. I just turned 35 last week. Of course, again, kidding here, but uh, I've been in the business very uh, seriously for a long, long time. I've been working with a lot of different uh, LIDAR approaches lately, from static to mobile to boat-based, ATV-based, parachute plane, plane, um, drones, balloons, you name it. We've been into everything, uh, practicing and running uh, real survey controls against it to know what it really does. So on reality capture and practice, we've done all types of uh, test beds and real projects. We're also going to talk about collection methods, <clears throat> and there may be some things out there you haven't even heard about. I, I learn every day in this business. We'll talk about deliverables, and here I speak to you as a surveyor. If you ask me to do a road intersection, I'm going to find out all the pertinent information you need to do your intersection, and that will determine how I capture my data. So deliverables are huge, the deliverable requirements are huge, and then based on all the above, determining the best solution. And you, right this moment, you may think, oh, we could use, uh, I'll give an example, we can use a drone with a, a camera to do this whole uh, site, whatever it may be. But, and you know what, in a lot of cases that may be true, but coming out of this one hour session, you're going to realize the cases where maybe you need to supplement with other data. That's the intent of this. So let's step in here. Reality capture and practice, you know, uh, Autodesk and uh, Recap are really purpose built, or a uh, Recap is purpose built for uh, factories, plants, and buildings. It really does nice segmentation, sectioning, everything else that lets you take the point cloud manipulate it, roll it to things like Revit or Inventor very nicely. So if you haven't, and I know this is a transportation call, but if you are doing buildings at all, be aware that that is really designed very nice to do things like that, chop things up. Uh, ships are another thing. We work with the Department of Defense heavily. We work in shipyards. We scanned uh, all many, many ships using uh, static scanning approaches combined with classic uh, scanning. Uh, we've been on National Geographic, some of our team on the USS Constitution and on the USS uh, Arizona down in Pearl Harbor. We've done underwater scanning approaches. We, we've looked at all kinds of things, and, and we're here if you have questions on stuff, we'd love to work with you. Construction sites is another key area for scanning, and uh, you know, it, it, oh, you can open your mind on construction, for example. I've laid out a lot of uh, skyscraper type work in the past in my younger life, and it aged me significantly worried about if I had the hub and tax or things in the right spot. With the uh, ability to bring out uh, you know, a terrestrial scanner even and quickly scan a site, take that site into the applications we provide to run a uh, check to make sure these stakes are in the right place, Things like that are just absolutely huge, can be mo monumental uh, monetarily. Now, another thing, quarries, we've got quarries going on all over the place, open pit mining, all types of things. And in a situation like this, that looks obvious that, you know, even uh, imagery with some control set would work well on that. But if I just showed you this picture and I told you I want everything in this picture surveyed, and you see all these heavy trees over here, the imagery is not going to penetrate the trees, which I'll show you later, 
but LiDAR could. So you may say, you know, I can get all this with imagery right here, but in the trees, I'm going to need to use a different approach. Either run some ground control or get a, a LiDAR unit so I can penetrate the foliage and get the bare earth. And then maybe as you just update the uh, excavated type areas, you just need imagery. But when you initially did things with vegetation, you also need LIDAR, or you're not going to penetrate and get bare earth. And I'm going to give you examples here. And then on infrastructure, I want you to be thinking here, you know, you could do terrestrial, and, you know, that's with a tripod and a scanner. But moving ahead, or, or a lift truck, that's beautiful. But moving ahead, you know, it takes time. And if you're going to do many, many miles, then you need to be thinking, well, could mobile LIDAR work? And then you need to be thinking about accuracies and control and all these things. And uh, again, uh, that's one of the things we're here to help you. After this call or this session, you'll have our contact numbers. And if you called uh, myself or Steve and said, hey, uh, I want to do resurfacing on 10 miles of roadway, you know, here, wherever it may be. And, and the next, first thing I'm going to ask you, what type of accuracy do you expect? And you're liable to come back and say two hundredths of a foot. So when things like that come into play, then automatically you've got other issues coming in where you've got to bring in tighter control and all kinds of other considerations as you price this and put the right hardware out there. Whereas if you say, I want to get all the signs and things like that, I still need them absolute within a foot. I mean, then, then you're looking at 20 times the speed of collection uh, maybe a 20th the cost of collection. So all of these things are key in each of these areas, okay? So let's step forward. Now, collection methods. This first one, you might have thought, well, that, you know, that's too expensive. We're not going to touch it. Satellites, satellite work, and, and I'll use a Airbus as one company, the one that makes airplanes, has very inexpensive imagery. Uh, and uh, multi-spectral data. Another is Digital Globe. Again, you know, uh, commercial com companies out there I'll cover, but the cost of satellite data has gone down magnitudes. So it's not the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, it's hundreds and thousands. So the price is way down. The imagery, you could almost, I've seen like, like Digital Globe, you can just about read the license plate on a car with this stuff. You could pick out people from this imagery. Uh, remote sensing, multi-spectral type things, uh, they have the ability to look where water's out of the ground or where there's a, a heat issue, all types of things, multi-spectral views. So that can open your mind. And what this is about, satellites can supplement so like I've got LIDAR right here, you potentially could use satellites on that mine area, get extremely accurate, but in the trees, you know, satellites can't penetrate the trees either. You may have to supplement with LIDAR and combine the models. So let me say one thing, all of these models can be combined. And when I say combined, I mean by Civil 3D, it could be InfoWorks, it could be Map 3D, uh, those of you using Geopack, there's ways to combine it for that, or, or any applications. Of course, this data can be combined, put on the same coordinate system, and the more accurate data could override the less accurate data. So let's look at aerial. Aerial comes with LIDAR and imagery, and they can be separate. You could have just LIDAR or just imagery or both. So these can be mounted on planes, helicopters, parachutes, drones, and even balloons. So balloons, you'd say, what are you talking about there? Uh, again, it's based on, well, like LIDAR uh, has IMUs and all types of things like that. If it's keeping track of it, and you're pulling a balloon behind a vehicle, let's say, so you could get the altitude where you couldn't get it with an ATV you're able to get through with this, it could still capture the right data or even imagery. So, uh, you know, open your mind. Whatever you can think about pretty much probably can be done or has been done. On mobile LiDAR and imagery, again, uh, we've got units that you can carry in a Pelican case. Go get on a plane. I could be in Florida this afternoon and we could be out scanning easily, and I'm in Alabama. 
northern Alabama. So you could carry this, mount this stuff on a rental vehicle, and be off to the races immediately, this car, truck, four-wheeler. So it doesn't require an insane amount of hardware to do it. Backpacks, another thing. Uh, in fact, uh, we did work in the city of Hoboken, uh, right across from New York City. And uh, if you've ever been to Hoboken or New York City, you know these people never get off the street with parking. So if you're going to do, you theoretically think you're going to do a mobile LIDAR scan, but you can't get past the cars, how do you do it? And then you could say, well, I'll take a four-wheeler down the uh, cur or the sidewalk. Well, guess what? That's not that easy to get a permit for that kind of thing. A backpack, anybody can walk down a sidewalk. So always it comes down to what do I need to do what I need to do. And so just keep your mind open there. Another one is boats. The same thing with that Hoboken. Uh, that was a, directly impacted by Hurricane Sandy. And one of the other things with a scan of the entire uh, city is they wanted the entire perimeters scanned. Now, we couldn't get out there with mobile LIDAR and see under the dock, so we took a boat, waited till low tide, and, and scanned everything around the docks, tied into the same coordinate system. And here's an example where we used uh, an L1, L2 GPS on site to keep the boat tied into the same survey we did with mobile LIDAR and backpack. So the data all merged, and it made an absolutely stunning model. The same with rail. Uh, there's multiple solutions, depending on what you want to do. You can mount on a rail system. Uh, I was involved in one job, 900 kilometers long, did 900 kilometers in Brazil. And, and here's where we learned a lot of lessons about uh, leapfrogging with GPS and ensuring and probably having uh, duplicate GPS differential as you scan down a corridor. And one other comment, trusting, and, and I don't mean it in a bad way, but trusting VRS or CORS or using OPUS uh, without your own differential GPS sometimes can be dangerous. What if they're down and you went to capture all this stuff and you went to that static unit and you couldn't get the GPS? So redundancy is always something I consider almost mandatory. So all of these mobile things, you know, you can rail mount, you can uh, many different ways with this. Now another one, and in fact, I will tell you in Japan, many years ago I learned this technique. Uh, they wanted to do surveying through some of their uh, very large uh, pipes and they'd have water out of them and everything, and they looked at how can we, you know, survey this, know where we're at. So you could use a combination of linear referencing. Uh, you couldn't use GPS underground, but uh, all of the, you know, time-based collection, all of that, you can run tracks through tunnels. or well, tunnels, that's a different story, but through long pipes and that, where you could keep track of the inside. Everything's doable if you stop and think about it. What do I need? Now, terrestrial LIDAR and imagery mounting, everybody's probably familiar with that. That was the first one out. Tripod-based, you put the unit on it. Or like in Florida where you guys have got the lift units so you can be in traffic and uh, raise the lift and protect your, your folks, that's absolutely great. They even have handheld uh, units now where basically it's like a pistol. You can point it at stuff and it will uh, capture uh, LIDAR and potentially imagery. And let me throw one thing at you. Why would you, I mean, where does imagery come in with LIDAR? And I want to also be clear, imagery doesn't have to be taken at the time of LIDAR as long as you can rectify it to the real world. And what I mean by that is if you take images with a drone and, you, and it's above where you did the LIDAR, you can stitch that together, get it in real world coordinates. So what does that do for you? Well, what it does for you is you can marry the LIDAR with the imagery. And what do I mean by that? I mean, let's look at, uh, we'll, we'll step over here in a minute, to the LAS format, the LIDAR format. There's a red, green, blue portion of LIDAR. That's just an attribute of a point that's updated after the fact with imagery. Then you could say find, uh, you know, anything that meets this color and then classify it as this. It gives you the ability to classify, which I'll get into in a minute here. So let's talk about that for a moment. Geo-referenced and adjusted LIDAR data can come in that LAS format. 
And look down here, red, green, blue. Okay, that's one of the things. GPS time, user data. It, and uh, I'm bringing this up because if you don't know what can be captured, you don't know what you can leverage. So I guess I'm really getting into the technical here a little bit, but you need to know that. For example, intensity. Uh, you know, you want to make sure you can get good intensity if you're doing a road scan that's got uh, white striping and yellow striping. Those can be different intensities that can be used to subsequently do auto best fit of line work, okay? 3D line work that you can turn around and use in model building. So intensity comes in. What's return number have to do with anything? Well, return number, when we're going over the trees, vegetation with LIDAR, the first hit of the signal will be in the leaf or foliage, whereas the very last return would be at the lowest point, potentially ground. So potentially right there you could say, uh, give me last returns on all the stuff through the woods, and potentially, you know, that's one of your filtering criteria. That could be the ground. Okay, I mean, versus the first return, which would be the leaf. So all of these can be used to be smart. The other one is classification, which I'll run into that. That's absolutely huge. That's where industry has put a lot of effort. Autodesk has put a lot of effort in classification. So you know if a, a power pole is a power pole, it's not part of bare earth. Or you know bare earth is the lowest part of the ground. Or you know a fire hydrant is a certain thing. So let me step into this a minute. So updated from imagery, merged with LIDAR, red, green, blue. There's many ways to do this. The first way I'd advise of you is have the vendor do it. When I say vendor, I mean of the hardware. I don't mean software. So uh, data collection devices, many of them, well, I've used example, Ferro. The Ferro scan terrestrial uh, captures imagery and LIDAR together. And that's very easy to get red, green, blue out of that, right? Boom, right off the machine. Some of the mobile LIDAR, you have to use other techniques. But also there are other softwares, if that didn't happen, that you could come back after the fact, get imagery, and merge it. So tools like that exist on the market. Another one is classification updated by filtering point data. This is where Autodesk has spent a lot of time with InfraWorks. And so it automatically classifies data. If, and that would be in a subsequent session, we'd go through that. But you can take a raw point cloud in now and say, one, say you find bare earth. And it will find bare earth. And you can also say, take it from, uh, take it down to 10% of its size and maintain the accuracy. That is in InfoWorks right now. Okay, another thing you could say is find any vertical features that just released with InfoWorks right now where you could automatically classify anything that shoots up from the ground. And then you could use that, again, in InfoWorks, Revit, Civil 3D, uh, you know, Map 3D, all kinds of places. So that's, that's a big one there. So let's talk about deliverables, rectified point clouds based on full-featured uh, LiDAR raw data. Here again, a, a word of advice to you is, whether you're using terrestrial LIDAR or mobile or aerial, generally my recommendation would be you have the person doing the capture of that data rectify the clouds. Let me give you an example. If you're doing lanes and you're doing multi-pass lanes down a, court, a highway, uh, by default they may not sew together perfectly lane to lane, and by that I mean on the Z, the elevation. And so get the vendor where they uh, tie these things down so when you get the data, it's tied down extremely tight, and that means they need to know how to use the right kind of control, uh, the right points to sew it together, all of that. So my first recommendation is that. My second recommendation, if you don't do that, is, there, again, there's software that will let you tie it together down yourself. And the, for the surveyors on the line, I know you guys really wouldn't want somebody adjusting your traverses, you'd rather do it, I'm sure of that. And, and I, this is almost the same thing. You got the, the, you guys as surveyors would have the control down, you'd want to adjust it yourself. You wouldn't want somebody that doesn't understand how you ran the control necessarily to do it. However, of course you could do that. It, it's all in your procedures. 
So number one, the number one, if you don't get past number one, there is nothing else. It's done. If your data isn't as accurate as you need it to do the rest of the things, stop. And I got to tell you, eight years ago, I first started looking at a lot of LIDAR, especially mobile LIDAR. In fact, that was longer. 2002, I started with New York DOT and uh, ARAN, and, you know, they were taken over by Fugro. They were the, they are the biggest scanners in the U.S. for pavement crack detection. And we were trying to make the next jump in the mobile LIDAR back in 2002. Well, back then, the algorithms didn't exist for the skew of the roadways and the uh, movement of terrestrial based vehicles. So we never could get below six centimeters back then vertical. And nowadays, you know, in all those years, there's been magnitudes of change so you can get the accuracies now. Uh, and again, it depends on what you want. But if you couldn't, I mean, so we stopped. This number one, we could never get past. So we stopped in 2002. We waited several years and now it's back and now it's for real. So the 2D and 3D stuff is for real. Contour lines, another one I'm going to bounce at you. If a client says, I want half foot contour lines, there's a lot of terrain and it's a large site. Well, all of a sudden, you're going to get into DWGs or DGNs that are massive. So versus carrying a civil 3D object or a geopack surface that the triangulation forms these, but they don't have to carry data there. So when you talk to clients and they say, I want a half a contour or a half foot contour drawing from you, and if you don't, you know, get this kind of stuff straight, you're going to have an awful hard time delivering a half foot contour map on a large area with a lot of relief because it'll be huge where the civil object, the surface could be very small and all it does is interpolate. So again, these things are things you got to work out. Remember about the Lonnie criteria based surfaces? That's where you can't have overlapping Z. And also be aware of things like cloud to cloud differences uh, or cloud to proposed differences. So if I ask you to go out and survey a, uh, a series of uh, peers on a new bridge and give me the difference, what most people on this phone would think is the vertical difference of these peers. Are they sinking or whatever? Uh, what really quite often is the need is that you survey the peer and you want to know if it's tilting or whatever. Well, how do you get that? That could be a cloud to cloud or a cloud to proposed difference where it goes perpendicular to the entity, to the point cloud. So it goes perpendicular and it finds the motion of the object. And again, we've got the tools for that. I, I'm not talking software on here, but we have the tools to do the cloud to cloud difference. So if you've got a pier that's tilting and you use classical survey, the, this, and, and this really happened and some people nearly died because of this, it was saved luckily. But the pier was tilting, it was within a centimeter of uh, collapse and the whole tunnel would have went down. And the engineering firm that checked it said, well, it's not moving. Because if you had marks on it, the vertical diffs weren't moving. But if you looked at it in terms of, is it moving? And you look at it perpendicular, all of a sudden you saw the motion and you could realize, oh my God, we're gonna have a failure. So we as surveyors and folks uh, doing cloud you've got much more power than you do with a, a Delaunay criteria based surface only. You can take things and look at them differently. And then lastly, inside models of buildings. And one thing I don't see a whole lot of, but I highly recommend, is if you're gonna survey a great big building, you could bring the control in from outside. So you're tied to state plane, things like that. Make sure you're tied to a coordinate system and you could say, well, I don't need it for this building, but if you ever want to just drop it in and use it in InfoWorks, Civil 3D, Mac 3D, without doing a spin and rotate, you could just take this building and drop it in the reality capture and it falls right in the right spot. So I think that's worthwhile, minimal effort to do it. So why not do it? And again, if you ever have questions on how to do it, we're here to help you. We'd love to help you on that. So let's keep going. Additional deliverables. You can see there's many, and I'm just touching on some of them here. There's many that could be done. If you can think about it, it probably can be done. But the other thing, the lowest common denominator is what data is in that point cloud, which we went over. 
in that LAS, if it's an intensity thing, if it's a red, green, blue, it's like missiles. If you know with missiles always are going to be a certain color red, you could automatically scan uh, airport runway and find all the missiles quickly based on color. So things like that. Another thing could be, what if it's metallic? Well, that might mean you need a multispectral uh, data set so use multispectral approach to find all metallic entities and use that in your filtering. So really open your mind to this stuff. Uh, another one, one of the biggies, real world accuracy. You know, uh, uh, let me say this, if you're gonna run machine control, the number one thing is you need to be tied to the control the machine control is gonna use. In other words, I'm really saying localization. Even though you may be state plane or whatever, if you're doing a 50 mile project, you know, and, and setting one state plane coordinate system running off cores or VRS uh, without control down the project, and you're doing curb and gutter, let me tell you, you're going to run into trouble. So here again, this is where the guys, the surveyors, lay out the construction control, tie into this stuff, and use it. So if you need the real world accuracy, relative precision, that's a whole nother beast. Let me throw this at you. You could, if you use a machine that's got good relative, meaning like the cross slope of the road is extremely accurate, the point cloud's not thick uh, like a ferro scanner. A mobile data set with a ferro scanner has a minimal thickness point cloud, meaning it's very accurate. But you may not be tied to real world coordinates or anything else. As long as the data set's accurate, you can come back after the fact using control tools to drop control in and slide the thing into absolute coordinates. So as long as it had relative precision, you could get real world accuracy. So all of these things are things you have to consider when you say, I'm gonna get this scanned and I don't need real world right now. Well, if you ever might want real world, make sure you get the right kind of scanning done so you could uh, rectify the data to real world. Another one, Original data set size restrictions. For example, state of Florida, if you guys went on mobile LIDAR, you could scan all day and you could have multi gigabytes of data. And if you want to reduce it quick or whatever, how are you going to do it? Are you going to move it on a wire? Are you going to move SD cards? I mean, how do you want to do it? And those, I'm not giving you the answer. I'm saying these are things you got to consider. And nowadays, with these little tiny SD cards, you could take an envelope from 10 scanners, you know, a letter size envelope, send it to a main office the next day and they could reduce it right off the cards. So the way of moving data now is very, very much improved. It's not giant computer banks that you have to move. So original data set and then delivered data set, that's a biggie. One thing just, and this is not a hard rule, Geopack, Inroad, Civil 3D, Carlson, any of them, you start getting over two million points in a surface model, all the software slows down. So if you hand a client a 50 million point civil 3D surface, you know, it'll generate this MMS file and all that. And I'm gonna just tell you, your client will never use you again, okay? So what you, and, and you know what? The client may never have said, well, I need it to be under two million. They'll never say that, even though they should, but they won't. And you could say it's not my fault, it wasn't in the contract. It's your job to deliver something they can use. So understanding these things, understanding about how to thin data and maintain accuracy, how to add break lines, things like that, so your model's small but accurate, that's the key. Because if you hand somebody a, a file over two million, I can tell you they're not gonna be happy. Another big one here is data spacing. And you could say, what does data spacing have to do with anything? Well, we've been doing a lot of tests, and this could come down to forensic science, like where there's accidents, or it could come down to where a vehicle flips over and all kinds of dangerous material spill, or, or it could come down to the case of the Air Force, where they blow up a runway and they want to be able to detect any bomb fragments that could still be active. So what do I mean by this? If we run a scanner at a certain speed, either on an aerial or a mobile device, you can do the math. If it does a million points a second and you drive 60 miles an hour, you can do the math and see what the spacing is. So if your object is the size of a softball and you're going 60 miles an hour, even at a million points a second, it's not going to work. 
So here again, you need to do pre-planning. If I'm going to do certain stuff that's pretty small, then either I need multi-pass or I need to slow down and pick it up, or I need to go to imagery, which gets everything over LiDAR. And then what I need to do is densify the, the triangle formation of the imagery in the area of these key features. So this data spacing thing right here is critical. It, I'll give you another example, real one. If you're going to go out and you want to do mobile LiDAR of an entire community, a thousand miles of roadway, and you want, want to pick up all the distribution pole and lines. So you know the thickness of a pole, let's say you, you know the size of it, and you, you know your speed of collect. That right there could tell you the speed basically you need to go, but it also could tell you another thing. That potentially you need to tilt your scanners so that even at a higher speed it still picks up the entity. So instead of being perpendicular, it might be at a 45 uh, to the forward motion. And that 45 degree, even at 60 miles an hour, might pick that pole up. So all of these things are key. Linear feature extraction is another. You need to look at what do you want to get, and then that determines how you collect it. Colorized point clouds, another. To just put the red, green, blue on a cloud doesn't make sense if you're not going to use it. And then predefined classification values. I'm going to say this to Florida or Caltrans if they're on the line at anyone. What I recommend here is you make the classifications line up with your survey feature codes. So you could have, like, like you could use utilities, and that could have many, many sources of data. Or you could say uh, uh, fire hydrant, and fire hydrant could be one classification. So it classifies it, and then we have the ability to auto-vectorize it. And so pretty much inside of InfoWorks, you could find all the fire hydrants on a project. So again, all of these things are key determinants. And then pre-classified values, there's up to 250 classes or 56 available. These are the ASPRS uh, defined ones. But then, you know, you've got up to 256. So I highly recommend setting these up. And then that way, every time when you classify or whatever, it can use that set. And all of you would know where it's coming from. Additional LIDAR with filtering could be the return, like I said earlier, the intensity, and even things like physical nearest neighbor. That's how you filter people out or cars out of data. The physical nearest neighbor. I'm not going to explain it deeply here, but if, if it sees, it looks like the road is going or the uh, ground is flat, and all of a sudden you got a vertical entity in it, like a person, it can see that, flag them, classify them as something else, and make the bare earth without the person or the car. So that's physical nearest neighbor, it could be another filter. So now let's look at uh, satellites, large scale, cost effective, and timely. They've got high resolution. They, in fact, they claim, you know, nearly a tenth of a foot on bare earth if it's on multi-scan, comparing uh, scan today to tomorrow to the next day, extremely accurate. It can build digital elevation models. And another thing, it provides a historical look at the world, which I'll explain in a moment. Satellites are like the time machine. I've got just a quick little video <laughs> I'm going to pop up. It'll run quick, it'll be hard to see, but imagine a satellite in space and, you know, you focus it on a grid where you want to capture data. When you capture data, all types of things can happen here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let it pick up like Mount St. Helens. So right off the bat, you can see what's the solar potential. So if we're talking about putting solar panels out, what, what are our potentials in areas like that? Let's look at another one here. What about agriculture? If the entire earth is mapped for the last 15 years, which I'm going to get into in a minute. But if you know all the agriculture, then you can go around and pinpoint crop growth throughout the world, and you could impact things like world hunger and everything else. Map all man-made surface for city planning. Oil rig expansion, city surface materials. You know, uh, all types of entities could be captured. And another thing, Right here, you could have your imagery layer, you could have an information layer. This could come from GIS, it could come from anywhere. And then you could plug analytics in on this. And there's actually petabytes of data, and again, we can help you here, similar to a WMS server, where you can get at this stuff for anywhere 
anywhere in the world and do all types of things that you would have never thought you could do. So just real quick, I found this absolutely amazing. From 2000 to 2015, the entire world has been shot. I mean, pole to pole, absolutely everything to high accuracy. And this, this is Digital Globe that did this. And it used to be this stuff cost so much, we wouldn't even be discussing it on this call. This stuff has come down so dramatically, it's unbelievable. So if you have a thought that you want to monitor like Miami and see if you're having any, I don't know, maybe a shrinky or a, uh, that the city is uh, going down a little bit. If you're having some subsurface stuff, you can map the entire city of Miami and watch it over weeks, months, years. You could go back in time. You could say for the last 15 years has Miami moved it all. You've got access to all of that. Or you could pick any city or anywhere in the country and say, uh, let's pick uh, the West Coast. You want to look at landslides. You've got access to the imagery 15 years back. You could build a case out of the last 15 years, like a, along Highway 101 in California, of slope stability along that highway based on this kind of data. So be aware it's out there. Be aware Autodesk will be happy to help you get access to it. Uh, this stuff really is amazing what you could do. Now, this is going to take a moment to pop up. This is a, a geo-rectified TIFF of uh, some drone, just drone-based imagery. And uh, I'll show it to you here in a minute. So you could then, of course, reference this inside of Civil 3D, Map 3D, InfoWorks, wherever you like. And this was a part of the process. In fact, uh, this is, uh, uh, I've got a 40-acre track right here. And I went out on purpose, and I bush hog through here, and I bush hog different strips along here. So this is right at grass, and this, you can see the tufts of grass here, but you're at least four inches from bare earth. And then I ran uh, both trig levels and GPS lines through here so I could validate what kind of accuracy are we getting with drone uh, imagery, and then the other was with LIDAR and imagery. And I'll try to step through some of that now. So here is that same site where we spin it up, geo-rectified, and you know, it looks really good, okay? You, you can see here as I spin through this, uh, especially, but, but look at the bare earth where I mowed it, that looks really good. You see the grass over there? That's where we start to have a problem. I mean, if it's not mowed, it's only gonna be as good as the vegetation from just imagery. Now look at the trees. Looks like I got everything there, right? But when I go underneath, this is where the imagery is not getting through, okay? So I want to make this clear. You know, I mean, the, the trees in that look just beautiful. But when we get inside the trees, right in there, that black area, we don't really know what's going on with the bare earth because we didn't penetrate the foliage, okay? So my point to you here, imagery is fantastic, especially where I bush hogged it or where you've got bare earth like mines. But if you have vegetation around it, you may want to consider this right here, LIDAR-based topo, also with imagery. Now let's look at the same thing. Looks about the same, right? Almost the same. So we've got red, green, blue on this topo because we merged imagery with LIDAR. But when we come into this thing, when we look under the trees here in a minute, what you're going to see are the last returns. This is very important that you understand this. I'm gonna stop here a second. So this is the bare earth under the trees, okay? So I'll, I'll keep it going, but I couldn't have done that with just imagery. So when I did LIDAR, I got last return through the trees and I've got a, a beautiful model. And in fact, we've been seeing things that we, we couldn't see with our naked eyes. It just amazes us. So you see the trees now. And now you see the bare earth underneath it, okay? So again, if you've got a lot of foliage and you're gonna need to pick up underneath it, you see, see the nice terrain right here, then you do need to consider 
adding other uh, techniques to, than just imagery. But again, it depends on what you want. Now let me tell you where this can go. I can take this right into InfoWorks and we've got uh, this Hydronia plug-in. So I could take this property, pick any site that I want to apply, let's say uh, uh, incoming drainage, and this will take this ground-based terrain and do all types of hydraulic analysis on it. So the LiDAR ties right to the hydraulic set. That's a beautiful thing. It's just really nice. I'll, I'll touch on this for a moment. You know, I mean, if you can't get this in Civil 3D and use it, then what good is it? That's that model I showed you a moment ago. Brought it right in. It's geo-rectified, comes right in the right spot. Let's take a, a look at a quick profile here. When I look at the profile of this thing, you're going to see, and that, that came from InfoWorks straight down into here. I processed it in InfoWorks, and then when I come up and take a look, you can see it looks exactly like it should. It's not some jagged, terrible thing. So if I uh, grab this uh, polyline, move it, watch the update in the profile window. You can see it updates, and in fact, it looks really good. Look at these contours, the beautiful symmetry of them and everything. And again, to me as a surveyor, I appreciate that kind of thing. So <laughs> now let's, that was all drone based. So what I am telling with drone is the one thing we found out is as we add uh, strength to figure based control, and the control is only as good as you set it. If you set GPS control, remember you got about a 0.13 vertical flux. So we'd set control with GPS for X, Y, and we'd run levels through it for Z. If you want to compare absolute, okay? So don't use something to compare horizontally or vertically that doesn't match what you expect. That's all I'm saying. Now here's a quick example. Uh, we mounted this on a boat and we drove along the shore. This is just color based. I, I want to show it for effect, but I live on the Tennessee uh, River up here or near it. And with these bad floods and all that, you see all these trees laying out here? You could take a boat, and it's all geospatially located, all of this data, survey the coastline of the Tennessee River up and down, because they're all back. Turn this data in uh, to the Tennessee Valley Authority or the Corps or whoever, and immediately they can isolate places to go out and do work or fix things. So shoreline surveying is great. There's buoys out there. Here's the lines between them. Here's barges. I mean, just if you look at what we can pick up, it's amazing. So this could be done with red, green, blue. If you needed to mark out a FEMA floodplain on here, you could do this. Or another thought, if you need more elevation, you could even tow something with your uh, boat that's at a higher elevation and capture. Now here's a classic roadway. I'm, I'm just, I'm gonna whip through to this for a moment to show there's bare earth classified, and when we get in here, this right here is an example of classified features. So again, I used InfoWorks to do that, and then when I pulled it into Civil 3D, turn classification on, you can see like the bare earth is white, but all these other things are different colors. They're all classified accordingly. So that's what classification would do. Now, real quick, Here's an example. This is Hobo, where we took, I think it is, it might, it might be down in Florida. I apologize if not, it's probably Florida, actually. Uh, where we took the scan and uh, we just connected it. Yeah, this is FDOT. This is the model from uh, the FDOT team, beautiful model. We connected it with the uh, InfraWorks model. And what you can see is this stuff, you know, lines right out on it. So in terms of aids, I mean, the aid, uh, InfraWorks imagery combined with LiDAR, it's, it's just amazing what you can do with that. So you can see the lines through here. You can vectorize them. Uh, you can see the buildings. You can see everything. Okay. Now, terrestrial, just for a moment, this was uh, up in New York, a tunnel, a little piece of a tunnel. So this is a terrestrial. Actually, this was, I believe, a mobile scanner, but it could have been terrestrial. You can see the angle that the scans were done. And what this is, you could say, well, what could I do with that? Well, there are ways to cut uh, 3D cross sections on things like this that don't 
honor Galani criteria. Again, we could explain that to you, but there are tools where I could go down that and uh, collect it in 3D and put it in Civil 3D, project it into a section. Here's an example of a ferrule scan of a uh, uh, electrical state substation. So you can see real quick, I mean, we went around this thing probably, I'd say 15, maybe 20 minutes. But then you've got highly accurate data that you can turn around and do all types of uh, work with. So the, the brownfield on substations, this is absolutely perfect. Or anything that you don't have plans on, scan it and turn whatever you want into accurate plans. So this, this gives you a little look at uh, how that could be done. Now, I want to save some time for uh, any questions. And we just, believe me, I could go much further with many things. I, I will just share this. We were in Florida last week at Panama City uh, working with the Air Force, and we were looking at runway surveying. So we used uh, drone, drones, GPS, digital levels, all that, and we were looking at when you blow something up, how do you automatically recognize that it's a crater or a specific hole type or whatever? And that could be done comparing cloud to cloud. Or how do you identify things in the field? And, uh, you know, uh, that's some of the automatic vertical recognition tools that we've got in InfoWorks now. So there, there are some great things coming, and there's some great things coming right now in the current release of InfoWorks that, again, will do the bare earth extraction, the vertical extractions, all of these things. They exist now. I highly recommend you get them, uh, try them out. And you've got my name and number and Steve Stanfield's name and number on here. Well, there's very, in fact, there's various drones. Uh, they range from, Autodesk actually sells a drone set with software. I think it's like $3,500 with a, uh, I mean, that's a pretty high-end one with, with all the controls and the software. Uh, we've got lower-end drones that could be a uh, $500 drone uh, with imagery, you know, is more than adequate. It really what it comes down to, Randy, is that you fly the right paths. You could have a $100,000 drone and not fly with the correct kind of path that the software can't reduce it. So it comes down to there's two methods of uh, drone collection. One is a circular base, like around a cell tower, where you fly around it and go up it. And another is more like a lawnmower base, where you go up and down like a runway. And you've got overlapping photos that then could go in the recap photo and rectify and give you a model. So on, on the lighter camera stuff, Randy, it, it ranged from uh, 500 to 3,500, the different drones we used. On the LiDAR mounted, and, and this is with an IMU, uh, a Velodyne scanner, uh, GPS antenna, all of that, you're, you're looking at probably 20,000 on a drone like that, or maybe a little more. And those can go up way past that, but, but that would carry the weight of the drone or I'm sorry, of the LiDAR instruments in that. I, I hope that helps. I mean, and there's many different brands. That was about, at the very most, 15 minutes, very quick. I mean, we, we used the, uh, you know, lawnmower approach, kick it off, let it run, and go. And, of course, the lower the altitude, the more, just like photogrammetry, the, the more option uh, for higher accuracy data, okay? But, but I mean, it's very quick. We're... Well, that was 40 acres, 40 acres in about 15 minutes. I mean, we've, we've run, uh, you know, tests through the data also, and you're, you're looking at, uh, you know, where you probably fall within map accuracy standards, like uh, the half the contour. But so I definitely say, uh, you know, maybe it depends, again, on the control. If you've got really good control or you're running differential GPS to that LiDAR unit, I mean, you could be see the, the points themselves could be, two, three centimeters on the accuracy. You know, so the only question is, did you get enough penetration? But here in Alabama or there in Florida or in New York, normal forests, uh, we've been finding we get very good penetration. I mean, the one job was up by West Point, New York, and they uh, ground checked it, and they turned around and used it for hydraulic modeling. So, uh, I mean, I, I can't swear for the industry, of course, and but 
as, as you get used to your devices and you fly at different altitudes and you understand the control and you look at the thickness of a, a forest, like a hardwood could be different than a pine forest, you see? I mean, it, it all depends on the vegetation and the amount of uh, a ground intercept, you see? And one, one comment, quite often, you know, these forests, especially larger ones, don't have a lot of undergrowth. Whereas if you went in where they clear caught and it grew five years, and then you're trying to penetrate that, then that could be not so good because you can barely walk through the clear cut if they didn't clear it up, you see? So if theoretically you can walk through it and that you could get as good, I would say, as probably GPS in magnitudes of time faster. A few folks are out there and uh, you want to get into these things, we're here, we're more than happy to talk to you. You've got our numbers, our emails, and uh, we're trying to coordinate uh, with Florida DOT, excuse me, to make a tour of the state potentially with the districts and uh, some cities. And uh, we'll make sure the word gets out to you so we can meet in person and potentially execute on some of these on pieces of Florida, uh, you know, as we go so you can see it happen live. Well, thank you, Randy. Uh, thank you, everybody. Have a great day.